Ladies and gentlemen, sharing with us today his vision for a wiki future, please welcome Mr. Jimmy Wales. So uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about a few different things, uh, but it's all in the context of uh, leadership. Uh, and I basically, you know, one of the main points that I want to make about leadership uh, is that leadership is a very different thing from authority. Uh, and I, I actually have a dictionary definition in the slides, which you're not allowed to see yet, um, um, where I go through uh, some of the, the key elements of the concept of authority, and then I talk about leadership as being something different from that, um, and how each of the elements. And it basically has to do with the question of persuasion versus coercion. Um, and I think of leadership uh, as the capacity to persuade people, to inspire people rather than coerce them. Now in my work, this has been really fundamental because I lead a volunteer movement of tens of thousands of people around the world who build Wikipedia, this great gift to humanity that you've all uh, seen and that you've all used. Um, but in fact, uh, I think it's relevant to all businesses. And I think when we think about, you know, if you think of the, the phrase great leaders uh, throughout history, you might think of uh, some great military leaders or political leaders, and some of them can be quite authoritarian in a way. <clears throat> but even there, they didn't get to, to accomplish what they accomplished uh, by forcing people to do it or by you know, command and control. They also had to inspire, because in order to get people um, to really achieve something uh, impressive, uh, you've really got to inspire them. And so that's uh, what I'm going to be talking about. So in, in the context of Wikipedia, so Wikipedia, of course, um, <clears throat> is um, a very huge website, as you may have noticed. Uh, we are uh, something like the fifth most popular website in the world, uh, and that is true um, you know, in almost all places in the world. Uh, it's a very, very big uh, website. Um, so w Wikipedia began with a very simple vision. Uh, and, and Wikipedia began with this idea for all of us to imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the sum of all human knowledge. Uh, so that's what we're doing at Wikipedia. And so every element of that vision statement uh, is important. Uh, when we say um, every single person on the planet, I mean something very specific by that. I mean. Um, you know, literally every single person on the planet in their own language. And so uh, Wikipedia is inherently a global project. It's inherently multilingual. Um, we try to be in as many languages as we possibly can be. And also we have a vision that reaches beyond the internet. Um, everything that we do is freely licensed, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute, but one of the reasons for that is we want people to be able to take our work and distribute it as widely as possible even to people who are not yet online. Um, in terms of our organization, we're always driving to think about the developing world, to think about how can we reach more people. Still today, obviously, the primary mode for doing that is through the internet, and the internet is really beginning to explode in a lot of the places uh, that uh, you know, we, we didn't expect to see online for quite some time. So every single person on the planet, uh, that's really important. Uh, free access is really important. When I talk about free access to Wikipedia, uh, that's a very particular expression. So we come uh, fundamentally from the open source software world, uh, free software. Uh, and the idea here is that everything in Wikipedia is freely licensed. So this means that it is um, everything in Wikipedia, you can copy it, you can modify it, you can redistribute it, you can redistribute modified versions, and you can do all of these things commercially or non-commercially. So when people are putting things into Wikipedia, they're not just adding to this one uh, storehouse of knowledge, this one humanitarian project. They're contributing to a global intellectual commons, uh, something that can be reused and repurposed uh, for just about anything. So you can take from Wikipedia uh, and you can uh, create a book. You can create a textbook. You can hand it out to students in a class. You can translate it to a new language. Um, all of these things are completely freely uh, possible uh, under the terms of our license. So when we think about Wikipedia, um, we shouldn't just think about it as um, a website. Um, it's really mu something much bigger than that. It's something more important, I think, uh, than that. 
Uh, and this is something that really permeates our entire community and all of our decision making. Leadership different from authority. I just wanted to, to sort of uh, make this point because I think it is important and it sets the context. Uh, you know, authority is the concept of the power or the right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. Uh, this is kind of the, this is the top-down aspect of getting people to do things. Um, and leadership is a different mode. It, 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 taking those three things, it's inspiring, guiding, and encouraging people. So we can take a, a look at these things in turn. Um, you know, in terms of authority, you can give orders. Well, at Wikipedia, I can't really give orders to volunteers. Um, but I can inspire action. I can talk about where we want to get to and why we need to do certain things in order to achieve those goals. Um, I don't really make decisions, but I can guide decisions. I can remind people of our fundamental principles and what we're trying to accomplish and the values around that uh, in order to guide the decisions. And enforcing obedience is uh, not really something that's open to us. Now, in the Wikipedia context, we do have certain tools. If you're misbehaving in Wikipedia, you can be blocked or banned by the community. Uh, but really, a much more powerful mode of dealing with people is to encourage cooperation. So oftentimes, people come to Wikipedia, they may be new, they've been out in the wilds of the internet, and they think the way to get things done is just by yelling at people or insulting people or misbehaving. And we say, no, 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 that's not what we do around here. Yes, of course, we do have the tools to enforce obedience, i.e., if you don't behave yourself, you can be blocked. But much more strongly, we try to explain to people, hey, no, we're trying to write an encyclopedia. Uh, you know, we try not to behave that way. Obviously, we're human beings, so not everybody behaves perfectly all the time, uh, but we try. Um, so, framework for thinking. Um, so, a, a big framework for thinking uh, about all of these issues are <clears throat> Uh, two things, I would say, personal values and clarity of purpose. Um, and I actually uh, got these from, from, uh, from Icliff uh, in, in sort of our introductory conversation, uh, talking about the kinds of things. Uh, and it really resonated with me. Uh, the idea of personal values, uh, meaning, uh, you know, my vision for Wikipedia is something uh, that is very, very personal. Uh, Wikipedia comes from a place where I say, what kind of world do I want to live in, and how can I participate in making that happen? Uh, and really, that is a driving force uh, through all of my work uh, to really think about what it means to me and what I want it to be like. And then there's the clarity of purpose. And certainly, uh, when you're talking about a largely volunteer organization, clarity of purpose is crucially important. Um, people, when they show up and they say, oh, I like this Wikipedia thing, I want to participate, uh, they need to know exactly what it is we're trying to accomplish because if we have an unclear purpose, uh, then people are all over the map and you can't really get moving in the right direction. And again, as I say, I think that even though I come from this from the perspective of a largely volunteer organization, I think that these concepts apply across all organizations um, and, and, and that you, if you don't have clarity of purpose in any kind of a business, then uh, people don't know how to come together to work appropriately. Um, if it doesn't come from a place of personal value, uh, it all seems kind of meaningless, um, and, and that doesn't inspire people to do the right things. So imagine a world in which every single person uh, is given free access. Is this clicker actually connected to something, or I can just say click if somebody's on it? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so what is Wikipedia? So I've already talked a little bit about this, but I just want to say, uh, you know, one of the things that's important when we think about that clarity of purpose, uh, you know, I gave you the vision statement already, but what is Wikipedia? Wikipedia uh, is an encyclopedia, and, and this is really important. So when we think about Wikipedia, um, Wikipedia is an encyclopedia, so it is not a blog. Uh, Wikipedia is not a textbook. It's not a library. Um, it's not YouTube, so although I do love a funny cat video, uh, we don't really have funny cat videos in Wikipedia. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, one of the things that has made Wikipedia successful is that everybody is familiar with the concept of an encyclopedia. Uh, you know, the old-fashioned set of books about this big, um, A through Z, uh, a, a summary uh, of every topic that can fit in there. Uh, and so that general idea of what an encyclopedia is, if I say, uh, encyclopedia entry about the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, everyone in this room more or less knows what that's supposed to be. Uh, it is a clear, factual explanation of the history, why it was built, where it was built, who was the architect, what was the cultural impact, all those kinds of things. 
And Wikipedia is not, for example, a travel guide. So if you go to Wikipedia, you won't find um, you know, what are the five best restaurants near the Eiffel Tower or what are some activities to do after you've been to the Eiffel Tower. That's a travel guide. This is an encyclopedia. And so having that kind of a concept means that a lot of the kinds of arguments people might have if we weren't clear on what we were trying to accomplish um, are simplified. We, we know exactly what we want to do. Free access I told you about. The sum of all human knowledge. That's, you know, we, we're, uh, you know, an encyclopedia presents an essentialized summary of human knowledge. Uh, and so it's not all over the map. It's not everything in the world. It's just the basic factual information that you need. So this community has come together. We've written over 34 million articles. Uh, we have now over 400 million visitors every month. Um, we actually, it's, it's actually very increasingly difficult to measure our visitors uh, because we're seeing a huge increase in mobile traffic, which is not always measured um, as, as effectively as we would like. Uh, and it's also difficult to measure our uh, impact simply based on visitors or page views. Um, these days, uh, as many people um, will have noticed, if you go to Google and you type in a question, a, a basic factual question, so you, let's say you type, how old is Tom Cruise? Um, well, in the old days, uh, Google would just look for web pages that might mention the words. Uh, now, Google just tells you how old Tom Cruise is, uh, but they got that information from Wikipedia because they go through Wikipedia and they gather a lot of the factual information in our structured data um, and they're able to answer questions. So when we think about our impact on the world, it's larger than just what we're doing on our website. Um, it's fueling a lot of knowledge engines of all kinds um, all over the, the web. Uh, this is important. We're in uh, 288 languages. Now, uh, I, I feel that 288 is a bit optimistic. Um, uh, there are, in fact, about 220 languages that have at least 1,000 entries. Um, and so for that last group of languages, they're very, very small projects. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we're really interested on, I mean, different studies have shown that Wikipedia is by far the most linguistically diverse website. Um, but it's something that's very meaningful to us. Um, my, you know, we say a free encyclopedia for every single person on the planet in their own language. Um, a few years ago, actually nearly 10, I think it was in 2006, so nearly 10 years ago now, I made a more specific definition of that for my own personal goal, uh, which is to have at least, um, at least 100,000 entries in every language that has at least uh, one million native speakers. There are languages that have only 50 native speakers yet. I doubt with 50 native speakers we'll be able to get a fully comprehensive encyclopedia in their own language. But if you've got a million speakers, we know there are successful language versions of Wikipedia. They're re re relatively small, but to get to 100,000 is possible. Uh, and that number of languages is about 330. So there are about 330 languages uh, that have at least one million speakers. Uh, and so you can see we haven't even reached all of those languages. A lot of those small languages are uh, local languages in Africa. And so those people are not completely unserved because they will often know a uh, broader regional language like Swahili, or they'll know English or French. So it's not that people are completely unserved, but we still want to be in those languages. Uh, we have very, very active communities uh, in some small languages because people are very passionate about their mother tongue, particularly in places where uh, their mother tongue uh, has been suppressed for a long period of time or is in danger, maybe not from suppression, but just from being a small language in a, in a broader culture. And so some of our really great projects are in some of those small languages. If you look at uh, Catalan Wikipedia, Catalan is a language uh, of the area of, around Barcelona. Uh, in Spain, it is similar to Spanish, but it is sufficiently different that it is definitely a different language. And uh, the Catalan Wikipedians are very, very enthusiastic. Um, many years ago, under the dictator Franco, uh, Catalan was really oppressed. Uh, in recent years, um, well, if you ask really, really patriotic Catalonians, they'll say it's still being repressed. But m more realistically, it's just in danger because of the overwhelming dominance of the Spanish language culture. But it's still a very vibrant uh, language with the local newspapers, news programs. People speak it every day. And the Catalan Wikipedia is larger than you would think uh, because this group of people is very, very passionate about that language. Going forward, um, 
people are always interested in. When we talk about linguistic diversity, we talk about being global and in many, many different places. Um, one of the languages that is uh, particularly interesting is Chinese. Uh, Chinese being uh, obviously a very, very large language, but also China practicing the most extensive censorship uh, program on the internet of any country worldwide. And Wikipedia, uh, so our, our history with China is, is quite long at this point. Uh, there was a time when we were, you know, in the early days we were freely accessible in China. Uh, then we went through a period of about three years when we were completely banned in China. Um, and so during that time, uh, obviously Wikipedia didn't become famous and it didn't grow. Uh, it did grow, Chinese language Wikipedia did grow. One of the things to remember about Chinese uh, is that the number of people speaking Chinese who live outside mainland China is about the same as the number of Germans, period, right? There's a lot of people who speak Chinese. Uh, and therefore, we always had vibrant communities um, around the world, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the diaspora, you know, broader uh, people. Uh, there's a lot of people available who uh, are passionate about writing in Chinese. Um, and then we were accessible. Around the time of the Olympics in Beijing, uh, they opened up the internet quite a bit. They unblocked, uh, like the BBC, for example. They unblocked Wikipedia. Uh, and then we went through a long period. Uh, I, I went to visit the minister uh, in China twice. He's been to visit me uh, in San Francisco twice. Um, there was a long period of, I would say, equilibrium in which uh, we uh, we were broadly accessible in China, all language versions, but certain pages were filtered out. So the pages that would be filtered out would be things that are politically sensitive topics in, inside China. So uh, things like Ai Weiwei, the artist. Uh, you weren't able to view the page about him. Uh, you can, uh, anything uh, relating to uh, the Tiananmen Square uh, incident, that was a, a, a sensitive topic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's several topics that are, and it's, what you would pretty much expect is everybody's aware of the, the topics that the Chinese are very sensitive about. Um, but then more recently, uh, we've, we've taken a step backwards. So as of today, Wikipedia is completely blocked in China again. Um, I will be visiting, uh, I have to go back to London and then I'm back to Beijing uh, in two weeks time uh, to meet with the minister to see what we can do about it. But there has been a shift and the shift is technological. Uh, Wikipedia is now, um, completely encrypted. When you visit Wikipedia, it's the same as when you visit your bank. Uh, we do HTTPS, uh, so SSL, which means that the Chinese government can't see which page you're reading at Wikipedia. They can only see that you're accessing Wikipedia, which means that they're no longer able to filter out certain pages. And so they have a choice of all of Wikipedia or none. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's an interesting position to be in. So in the past, uh, you know, I would go to China and say, oh, why did you block the whole site? And they would say, well, we're offended by this particular page. And we would say, well, we don't think you should block that page. But if you're going to block something, just block that page and not the whole thing. Uh, now we're not going to be able to say that. Uh, we're going to say, you know, you really need to have Wikipedia in your country. And so you should reconsider this decision. So it's a little bit more tougher diplomacy than what I've had to do in the past. But well, that's my job. So even though Wikipedia uh, has been banned in China and has a long history, we're about the number 50 website, we have had a kind of a cultural impact in China. Uh, this is a, museum, uh, a menu that someone sent me from a restaurant in Beijing, uh, Wikipedia fried with eggs. Uh, we can click here. Beef brisket and Wikipedia flavor. Someone sent me this menu and they said, um, Jumbo, that's what they call me online, Jumbo, um, what does this mean? And I wrote back and I said, I have no idea. Uh, but I said, uh, here's the um, Wikipedia bread company. Uh, got a little note in the background. That's uh, very funny that that just showed up. Uh, it's like a Starbucks. It's quite nice. Um, good coffee shop. So I emailed back. Uh, I said, well, listen, I, I don't know the answer, but I know who will know. I'll email the Beijing area uh, Wikipedia group, and I'll ask them. So I emailed them, and I said to them, what does this mean? And they wrote me back, and they said, Jimmy, we have no idea. <laughs> Stir-fried Wikipedia? <laughs> I, uh, I like it spicy myself with <laughs> pimentos. Uh, so 
we, we really do have no idea. The, the one thing that we see is that a lot of these menus started to appear around the time of the Beijing Olympics. And so what we think is that in China, um, a lot of restaurants that traditionally did not have their menus in English at all, uh, they knew that millions of foreigners would be coming and that English would be a good language, and so they decided to translate their menus. Uh, but they maybe th they don't really speak English, and so they would say, um, oh, well, how do you say this uh, in, in English? And uh, oh, I don't know. And so they would go on the internet and they would type the name of the food. And of course, what's the first thing you find when you type anything into Google? Wikipedia. So <laughs> that's our only theory. So we, we don't really know. When we look at the, the, the top languages per capita, this is another thing that's interesting to look at in terms of the global scope of Wikipedia. Uh, some of the top languages uh, in Wikipedia per capita, um, so this is the number of entries relative to the number of speakers, and it's a very high number of entries. So Icelandic, Estonian, Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish. This, isn't, this is a selected group. These aren't necessarily the top top, but these are in that group of the top. And I chose them uh, for specific reasons. So when we say why, why are those languages so big in Wikipedia? I have a theory. It's really cold there. <laughs> and nice in by the fire. So, uh, so it's a joke, but when we do look at the, the range of Wikipedia around the world, uh, most of the factors that we see are easy to understand. So if, you have, if your language, because we divide things by language, not by country, if your language has high literacy rates, uh, then you tend to have a larger Wikipedia. If you have uh, broadband, fast, uh, affordable broadband internet access, that helps a lot. Um, and, but also, weather does matter. Um, we find in the colder climates we have larger Wikipedias. So when we look at the content, of Wikipedia. So what is the content like in different languages? Because obviously uh, there are cultural differences around the world. People have a different view of the world in many cases. Uh, and so this is a common uh, question is how does it change? Now one of the things that's important to understand about Wikipedia is that Wikipedia is not translated uh, from language to language to language. It's not primarily an English website that gets translated. Uh, it's written, you know, by local people in their own language. And obviously some people do some translations uh, if it's the easiest way to work. But in general, uh, Wikipedia is written by local people everywhere. Uh, well, sometimes reporters say to me, because we know uh, that we have a strong male demographic in our community, um, people say, oh, isn't it a problem that Wikipedia is all written by young white men? And I always say to them, Obviously, you've never met the Japanese Wikipedia community. Uh, it is a problem that it's mainly written by young men, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but we are reasonably diverse, at least um, globally. Um, so when we look at the, the content comparisons, uh, one of the things that we looked at, so it's not in terms of what people write, but in terms of what people read. And th we did this um, study uh, looking at the, uh, what is popular. So the languages here are English, Chinese, Japanese, French, German, Russian, and Spanish. Um, one of the things that immediately will jump out at you is that Japanese uh, love pop culture. Uh, and if you know anything about Japan, actually, uh, somebody here in the front is laughing about this, but it's actually true, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a true thing about the Japanese is that they do love pop culture. They love English pop culture, American pop culture, Japanese pop culture. It's a big part of life in Japan. Uh, and so it actually makes a lot of sense that the pop culture topics uh, are very popular there. Um, other things to look at is that the Germans are the most interested in geography. I'm not sure this is a good thing. <laughs> I, um, I don't make that joke when I'm in Germany. They're still a little sensitive about their past. Uh, and then finally, of course, everyone knows that human sexuality is an important topic on the internet. It's, a, you know, it's something that people in the privacy of their homes, they like to, to read about. And if you look here, uh, in Wikipedia, in almost all of the languages, and this is a, a very limited study, of course, we didn't study all the languages, um, sex is among the most important topics, except for in French and in Spanish. Um, I wasn't really sure why this would be the case. Uh, and then somebody explained to me, it's because the French and the Spanish are actually having sex. <laughs> and the rest of us are just reading about it on the internet. Uh, especially the Russians. So. Okay, well, 
it is fun uh, to, to have a laugh about this, but the good news is actually a lot of these differences are actually, when you really dig into the data more, some of the differences are actually show more similarity than difference. And so if you look at what's popular, so I'll just, I, I like to give this, this one example. Um, if you look at the traffic statistics for a politician called Nick Clegg, um, you will find that most people who are reading about Nick Clegg are in the UK. Nick Clegg was the deputy prime minister. And so he doesn't have a huge global profile. If you look for David Cameron, you will find much wider readership around the world because David Cameron, as the prime minister, um, would be famous in many, many places around the world and people would go and look. But Nick Clegg was mainly known locally. So when you see that Nick Clegg is more popular in the UK, you would say, oh, that's a difference. But in a way, it's not really a difference. Uh, it's just showing that people are interested in their local politicians. And so if you look anywhere in the world, you'll see that the traffic tends to be higher for local things. And this would be true of uh, you know, geography, technology, things that are more relevant locally. But they, so although you see differences, uh, they're actually similarities. Now, when we talk about my, my experience, I'm, I'm mainly I'm not talking about Wikia today. I will talk a little bit. But um, my experience ha has been primarily about getting large groups of people to work together. So Wikipedia, of course, we've talked about. Wikia is my for-profit wiki site. Uh, we now have about 136 million readers uh, every month. We're in over 200 languages. And Wikia is uh, a very different model in one sense, but very similar in another sense. So um, where you would have seen uh, Wikia, uh, it's like the 17th most popular website in the US. It is popular around the world. Um, these are communities that are focused around particular interests. Um, and the place that you might have seen it, uh, the, the most successful ones are in uh, computer gaming uh, and entertainment. And so for most people, if you really like uh, any of the modern genre of really complicated TV shows, so like Game of Thrones, House of Cards, Lost was a really popular one a few years back. Um, these communities come together to write incredibly detailed encyclopedias, and they're different from Wikipedia in that you don't have to have a source for everything. It's not all about third-party sources. People just watch the TV shows. They write summaries. They write biographies of the characters. So if you're watching Game of Thrones, um, which I'm trying to do now, um, you'll see um, if you've been away from it for a few weeks, then you come back to it, and you're like, oh, yes. There's like 100 different bearded kings, and you have no idea which one is which. You can just go in Wikipedia, and they'll, you'll get a quick summary. Or you can read the, the episode's uh, summaries for the ones that you watched last. I usually try, if I've been away for a while, I watch two or three, I read two or three of the episodes before I watch the next one so that I can get caught back up and remember what's going on. So uh, that's become very, very successful. And so one of the things that I think is important when we think about leadership uh, is not just to talk about successes. And so one of the things that I, I like to talk about uh, is failure. Uh, Jimmy Wales is good at it. Um, hopefully you've seen that today with the failure of the slides to work. Um, and so there is this mythology um, around success that uh, somebody has one brilliant idea and then it just takes off and it's an amazing thing. But in fact, the process of entrepreneurship, the process of leadership and becoming a leader um, is really not usually like that. Um, and so failure is a really important part. So early in my career, I was working in Chicago. I was a futures and options trader in Chicago, um, had uh, published an academic paper on um, index option pricing and so forth. Uh, and I was really excited about the growth of the internet, and I knew that something really exciting was going on there, and I wanted to be a part of that. Um, I remember I was working on uh, writing a web browser uh, at home uh, in my spare time. So I'd get off work, I would go home and write a web browser. Yes, I had no life. And, uh, and when I was doing this just as a hobby, then Netscape went public. And Netscape, uh, on the day it went public, was worth something like $4.3 billion. And my web browser that I was writing at home was not as good as Netscape, um, but it wasn't $4.3 billion worse. I knew that. So uh, I got more and more excited about the possibilities with the internet. And so I was working in downtown Chicago, and I had a brilliant business idea. I saw that people were using very inefficient ways to get food at work. They would fax orders on a fax machine. They would call and try to explain their order. They would send somebody out to get the food. And I realized that all of this would eventually come onto the internet. Uh, and so I started this, uh, the, my first sort of commercial website uh, to be an online food ordering service. Uh, what was the result? 
failure. Jimmy Wales is really good at it. Uh, this is in 1996, and restaurant owners looked at me like I was from Mars. Um, I would say to them, oh, we want to put your restaurant on the internet, and they're like, what does that mean? I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, and so it, it, I wasn't able to get traction. Uh, so then I was doing a lot of different things. I was working on, I had an idea for a search engine. Uh, this is a brilliant branding concept. Uh, it was called Three Apes, uh, and here you would say, type your search, and the apes will find it. How could this not succeed? <laughs> uh, true story. But there was a brilliant business idea here. The brilliant business idea was to have pay-per-click advertising, uh, but there would be two ways to pay, because I knew that one of the problems, uh, you know, if you build a search engine, and this is a very basic search engine, uh, one of the problems would be how do you get traffic? How do you get known? So there'd be two ways to pay. One, you could actually pay, and you could pay for advertising in the search engine, just like you do today at Google or, or whatever. Um, or you could send traffic and earn credits. Uh, so the idea is if people would link to us and they would send traffic, they would earn credits. So it was a way to build the, build the audience uh, by getting traffic. Uh, what was the result? Failure. Jimmy Wales is good at it. Chinese spammers took over the site within three months. Uh, we were getting a fair amount of traffic uh, searching for Chinese keywords. I didn't read a word of Chinese. Uh, and then I had Chinese people in very bad English emailing me wanting to know when they would get paid. Uh, and I had to sort of try to explain to them, no, you get credit for advertising. Uh, anyway, it didn't really work out in the end. Uh, so then there was Newpedia. Newpedia was the predecessor to Wikipedia. And the brilliant business idea is a free encyclopedia for everyone, written by experts. Uh, I hired a PhD in philosophy uh, to design it. Uh, what was the result? Well, as you've probably never heard of Newpedia, <laughs> you can guess, failure. Uh, Jimmy Wales is good at it. I spent about $250,000. Uh, on the first 12 articles. Um, I still keep them by my bedside. I read them every night. <laughs> I will get my money's worth eventually. Um, uh, basically, I, we, we built a system that, uh, that didn't work. Uh, there was a seven-stage review process to get anything published. Uh, it was very intimidating for volunteers, and it was never really able to take off. Um, and in fact, the seven-stage highly academic review process didn't work. Uh, one of the first things that happened, even though we had a very rigorous process to get anything published, um, one of the first entries that we published, uh, about two days later, we had to take it down because it was found to have been plagiarized. Uh, and even though we had had this long, complicated process to, uh, to review it, uh, that process didn't work. So then I had a really dumb idea. Uh, again, free encyclopedia for everybody. Uh, open up a website, let anybody edit it. No advertising, no same business plan of any kind. Um, and what was the result? Success. Uh, even Jimmy can do it sometimes. <laughs> so Wikipedia, of course, has been a massive success, number five website in the world, changing the face of knowledge. It's a very inspirational story, the story of Wikipedia and what our community uh, has accomplished and continues to accomplish um, has been really great. So building on the success of that, I had a, another idea. I'll always have another idea. That's the nature of being an entrepreneur. Uh, is I always want to keep uh, growing and changing. Um, actually, as a side note, um, sometimes I talk to young entrepreneurs, and they must say, oh, yes, it must be very easy for you now to start something new. And I say, no, actually, it's a lot harder for me to start something new because I can just go around the world and give speeches about Wikipedia until retirement. Uh, it's quite a nice life, and I enjoy it. Uh, starting something new is actually quite hard. When you're young, it's the best time to start something new because if it fails, that's okay. Nobody's ever heard of you anyway, so what difference does it make? <laughs> so if I fail today, it's quite spectacular. So <laughs> Wikia Search uh, was the, the, the concept. Uh, got a lot of press coverage. This is Fast Company magazine in the US. As you can see, it says Google's worst nightmare. Uh, I'm not sure that was ever true, but my mother bought 10 copies, so <laughs> that was quite all right. Uh, and the idea of uh, Wikia Search was to be a completely open and transparent search engine. All open source software, we would publish all our algorithm, all freely licensed content, all APIs open, and let the users control the search results. You could add, edit, move things around, delete things, uh, et cetera. What was the result? Failure. Jimmy Wales is good at it. Had to close the project during the economic downturn. Actually, this is one of the great sort of, uh, I would say, painful moments in my career because the early results, the software was coming along nicely. Uh, people were interested. Um, there were a lot of ideas to explore. But this was back when Lehman Brothers collapsed. And we knew 
having invested, uh, you know, we had invested maybe a million dollars in it, but we knew to get it to where it needed to be, it was going to require another 10 to 20 million of investment just to get to the next level. Uh, and the venture capitalists were not investing at that time. Everything was in kind of a lockdown mode. Uh, and there was just no way to raise the money to continue the project, given that it was highly speculative and might not have worked anyway. Uh, someday, maybe I'll get back to that. But um, I, I do think that there is some interesting things to be done there. So this was at Wikia. So Wikia Search was one of our projects. And Wikia itself, though, continued to, to grow. Uh, the encyclopedia was the start. Uh, but the library is much bigger. And this is the concept of Wikia. As I told you about, uh, the idea here, build on the Wikipedia model, empower everyone to build the rest of the library, focus on making it easy to use. Think about topics that will have good ad revenue, which is something that we never do at Wikipedia. But here we do think about, like, what are the things that would have good ad revenue? What are the, the, the vertical markets that are interesting? Um, and was the result success? Uh, even Jimmy can do it a second time. Uh, Summary of knowledge was just the beginning. Wikia now has 120 uh, million plus monthly visitors. Um, we're, we have about, I think, nearly 300 uh, employees now. Uh, the company, we run it at very close to break even, um, and we do that deliberately. We could become profitable, but we prefer to just keep pouring all the money back into further growth. Uh, but it's a very solid, very fast growing business uh, that's doing very, very well. So what are the, some of the lessons that I've learned? Uh, and I think this is uh, really key. One of the most important, I wish I had invented this phrase, because it, it, when I heard this phrase, it really identifies something that I very strongly believe in, which is fail faster. Um, and so the idea here is to always be trying small experiments so that the cost of failure is relatively low. Uh, one of the things that I see a lot of people doing in, in a leadership mistake that people make is they dream and dream and dream the one big idea, and then they plan and plan and plan, and they never actually get around to doing it. Uh, and it's really important uh, to do it. Uh, don't tie your ego to a particular business. Um, as you can see, I've done a lot of different things. Now I'm very much the Wikipedia guy. That's what people know me for. Uh, I could be known as the, the food ordering guy, um, but I, I missed that business. I was about, th those are really big and very successful businesses today. I was about 10 years early, I think. Real entrepreneurs fail and fail and fail, um, but you have to enjoy yourself along the way. Uh, if you're enjoying yourself, uh, then in the end, you will succeed in, in one way or another. One of the things I always say and I emphasize, particularly to young people, is the next five years is going to go by no matter what you do. Um, and so if you go and you have something and it's exciting and fun and you go and you, and you do it for a few years, and it doesn't work out in the end, at least you had some interesting years. You can always go and get that job at the, you know, a big corporation or whatever. It's more important that you get those skills. One of the things that I would advocate in general um, in all of business, and I think this is something that Silicon Valley does very well, is to think about how do you look at a failure um, you know, of someone uh, early in their career. For me, it's an exciting thing to see. Um, I just hired someone in London uh, on a new project I'm working on. Uh, and the main reason I hired her is that she launched her own app. She raised a little bit of money. She was clearly undercapitalized. The business model wasn't fully thought through, but that's OK. My business models are never fully thought through. Uh, she did have an idea for a business model that sounded plausible, and it failed. Uh, it failed. She wasn't able to get enough traction. She wasn't able to make it successful. Uh, but she learned a huge amount from it, but it also showed me something about her as a person, that she had ideas and initiative and was willing to take risks and willing to do interesting things. So now I think I, I may be running a little late. How am I doing on time? We're, we're OK. OK, great. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I want to really talk about the future and some of the things that I see on the internet. And again, this is uh, in the context of leadership and in the context of what I would say is inspiration. Um, a big part of what drives the Wikipedia community forward um, is knowing that our, that our work is having an impact on the world, a positive impact on the world. Um, and, and we're really, really very passionate and, and dedicated to the growth of Wikipedia in the developing world. And so when people talk about the developing world and the internet, here's what people mainly know. Talk about mobile phones uh, and, and the growth of mobile You'll hear stories like this. This is from The Guardian. Mobiles give Africa's farmers the chance to set out their stall. 
The idea of the news story is uh, farmers, uh, they've grown some crops and they want to sell them. They can text across town and find out where the best price is. Uh, they don't get cheated by a middleman. Uh, they know they have more information about what their crop is worth so that they can sell for a fair price uh, and they make more money. Um, another type of example here, how cell phones are helping fight malaria. The idea here is in people in, in remote uh, areas, if there's a malaria outbreak, they can text the authorities and say, hey, help us, we've got a mosquito problem, can you bring some bed nets, can you come and spray, um, we need some healthcare workers. Um, and so how, how cell phones are helping fight malaria. Now, the thing about this is that those kinds of stories, they're true enough, but I think they cloud your mind. If this is your idea of what's going on in mobile in Africa, um, you're already a few years out of date, um, and it really does not represent what we're seeing today and what we will see coming up. Here's what most people don't know. So here's a phone. I, I, this is an old phone of mine. Um, I don't use it anymore, but I did for about two years. Uh, this is a 3G Android phone. Uh, it, does, it has all the apps on it. It does everything uh, that you would normally do on a phone. The screen is a little bit small. It's not a great, great phone. Uh, but the battery lasts for two days, which you can't say about your iPhone. Um, and um, this phone, when it was bought for me, a friend of mine picked this up for me, unlocked, 3G phone, uh, in Kenya for $75. Uh, that same phone today is still available kind of in remnants, uh, is about $40. Uh, but we now have um, a whole group of new phones that have come out. These are mainly Chinese manufacturers. They're selling very, very inexpensive uh, Android phones. Uh, the cheapest one that I found uh, to date is just about, uh, just under 40 US dollars. Uh, I saw one for 31, but it wasn't clear to me that I was looking at an unlocked, unsubsidized price. But for unlocked, unsubsidized, it is definitely now under $40 US. Um, and a lot of these phones, the sub $50 phones, uh, there's one of them that I was looking at where if you look at the specifications of the phone, so the pixel size, uh, you know, how many pixels on the screen, memory, battery life, um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 3G, it's identical, virtually identical to the original iPhone. So the original iPhone is nowhere near as good as your iPhone 6, but we all remember that original iPhone and how it impacted the way we thought about our relationship to the internet um, and having the internet really usable in your pocket all the time. Uh, it is a dramatic step forward, and now that phone, which when the original iPhone came out cost, I think, around $800, um, is now, we're looking at something that is under 50. So we're not reaching the poorest of the poor yet, but we've come a very long way down the economic ladder, and they're selling hundreds of millions of these phones in the next five to 10 years. Uh, this is an important event, both in technology, of course, that's the way people think about these things. It's really important culturally, politically, it's gonna have an enormous impact. When we look at internet usage, I'm just gonna look at one country, Nigeria, as an example. In 2000, 0.1% of the country was online. By 2006, 3.1. 2009, 16.1. 2011, 26.5. By the end of this year, that number is gonna be over 40%. So what we're seeing is that the explosion of access to the internet that happened in wealthier countries uh, back in the early 2000s, late 90s, is happening now in parts of the developing world. When we look at the reason for this, it's because of the bandwidth uh, in these places. So in January of 2002, uh, the entire nation of Nigeria had 72 megabits per second uh, connection. Just to put this into context, at my home in Florida, where we have Verizon Fios, so fiber optic to the home, I have a 150 megabit connection. Uh, so I, when I use it to download Game of Thrones, um, I'm very appreciative that I, that I have a connection that's twice as fast as the entire country of Nigeria just uh, that many years ago. By 07, 693, end of 2012, 12,000 megabits, uh, and that continues to increase. What's happening is they're dropping fiber optic cables um, under sea into Nigeria, down to South Africa, cables coming down the other side of the continent, which means that uh, bandwidth is being delivered to the continent of Africa um, in unprecedented ways, and this is only going to escalate. Uh, I was in Lagos, Nigeria a while back, and I uh, did a broadband seed test. I got, at that moment, I got 9.33 megabits per second. My friend in New York got 8.38. This is in Manhattan. This is probably more of a statement about the sad state of the internet in New York City. 
Um, but uh, you know, this, this was true. When I, I tweeted these uh, results and uh, some local people, uh, tech people there in Nigeria said, oh no, the, that's, that's not true. The government's tricking you. you know, we don't have that kind of bandwidth here. Uh, but it wasn't a trick. But the truth is, I was at a five-star conference hotel that had a nice internet connection. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that people in Nigeria have faster internet than in New York. The point is, it's to the country, uh, and this is having a huge impact. We're seeing uh, wholesale broadband prices are collapsing. Uh, retail costs of accessing the internet is dropping all the time. So the question is, what are people doing? Are they searching for prices for crops? Are they reporting malaria outbreaks? Well, maybe, but. Um, really what you want to see is what are the top sites across Africa, and it turns out they're Google, Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, local newspapers. The point is when these people are coming online for the first time, they're joining the global conversation. They're doing all the kinds of normal things that everybody does online. They all have local eccentricities and things that they do locally that uh, aren't done elsewhere. Of course, the same thing is true in any, any location. The point is there is now a very strong rising, I would say, information middle class. Uh, even amongst people who are still very poor, they are beginning to have very affordable access to information. Uh, and this is a really important global trend. The ongoing march of technology is making real and usable internet access available to millions of people, tens of millions of people today. Um, this is already happening. But if you really think forward 20 years, we're going to have massive connectivity, the real internet, for hundreds of millions of people. Uh, and importantly, uh, they don't speak English or French. So a lot of times when people think about um, Africa, they say, well, you know, everybody speaks English or French, so why bother? It's just not true. Um, I was actually, I was in India, uh, had, a, had a lovely dinner with a group of Wikipedia volunteers. Uh, we went around the table and people filled out uh, on a piece of paper, they marked uh, what their local tongue was. We had eight uh, mother tongues around the table, quite common for a, a meetup in India. And afterwards this uh, young man came up to me and he said, I don't really know why you care so much about all these local languages because everybody in India with a computer can speak English. Uh, he was wrong then, but he's really wrong now. Uh, only like 40 to 80 million people in India speak English, uh, depending on how you, how you count it and how you measure it. Um, and you know, there are hundreds of millions of people who do not. So it's really important that we have Wikipedia available to people in their own language. So one of the projects that we've got going at Wikipedia is called Wikipedia Zero. Uh, and the concept of Wikipedia Zero is we go out to the mobile carriers and we negotiate with them to offer um, access to Wikipedia with no data charges. <clears throat> so the idea here is that we want to go into places where data is still very expensive for people and we want to get them access to Wikipedia. Remember, uh, free access to the sum of all human knowledge is, a, is our primary goal. Um, and we've been very successful at this. Um, as of today, there are about 600 million people who in theory have access to Wikipedia uh, in this way. I say in theory because these are the carriers where we've signed deals. But those inexpensive smartphones are not yet ubiquitous. And so at a lot of these places, these are people, they have basic feature phones. They've got their trusty old Nokia. They are not really accessing Wikipedia. But they are um, on a carrier who does it. This has ended up being a really fantastic program. It's a really a win-win uh, for us, for the consumer, and for the carrier. The carriers are very interested in upgrading people, getting people moving along, getting them off that old Nokia phone, onto a new phone, they want to sell them a phone, they want to get them used to using the internet, and this is a great way to, to get them involved. So one of the things that happened, and I'm going to close with this video, um, we had a, a, a group of young people, uh, teenagers in South Africa, we had announced a few deals, uh, and they started on their own, without any intervention from us, they started a petition asking their own carriers uh, to do Wikipedia Zero. And I just want to show you the video because it gives you a glimpse of what Wikipedia means to people, uh, young people in particular, in the developing world. <laughs> Hi, this is a letter which me and my classmates, my classmate wrote to access to Wikipedia for free. It goes as follows. Open letter to Salsi, MTN, Vodacom, and ATA. We are learners in grade 12 at Sininjong High School, Joslovo Park, Milnatin, Cape Town. We recently heard that in some other African countries like Kenya and Uganda, cell phone providers are offering their customers free access to Wikipedia. We think this is a wonderful idea, a 
and would really like to encourage you also to make the same offer here in South Africa. Our school does not have a library. 90% of us have cell phones, but it is expensive for us to buy airtime. So if we could get free access to Wikipedia, it would make a huge difference to us. Normally, when we do research, Wikipedia is one of the best sites. And there is information on just about every topic. Think of the boost that it will give us as students and to the whole education system of South Africa. Our education system needs help and having access to Wikipedia would make a very positive difference. Thank you. 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 And goes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. This is an open letter to the youth of South Africa and the student of Sinenjongo High School in Cape Town. You recently shared a video asking South Africa's cellular networks to give their customers free access to Wikipedia. We think this is a wonderful idea. We know that many school children in this country don't have access to research material, which can make excelling at school so much more difficult. That's why MTN is proud to be the first South African cellular network to make Wikipedia free. Thank you.